Hello, everyone. Welcome to another capsule, International Relations Capsule for the Shankar IAS Academy. We have just finished 76 years of independence, and we are now in the 77th year. So I thought it would be a good idea to have a quick review of our foreign policy for the last 76 years. Doing it in a few minutes is not easy, but it will be just the salient points. The first thing that I'd like to say is that India has faced many challenges in these 76 years. Sometimes fundamental changes have taken place in global situation. But if you look at our performance in these 76 years, you will find that India has remained consistent on one thing, that we have been non-aligned. The word itself has been questioned. People say non-aligned movement ended in 1990 when the Soviet Union collapsed, as said as well. But I'm talking about the principle. The principle of non-alignment is and was freedom of action and independence in thinking. And this has remained so. Of course, it had several other features depending on the time of history. Like, for example, the colonialism had ended, the uh, imperialism, uh, was being questioned. So naturally, some of the attributes of those times, which were common to most of the independent countries which became independent after 1945, and they had these characteristics, anti-colonial, anti-imperial sentiments. But other than that, we have never been attached to a particular power or bloc. So Pandit Nehru invented non-alignment because he did not want to be on either side of the block, side one of one of the blocks. So he uh, began that, and there were many occasions when it appeared as though we would have had to relent on this. But if you look at the present prime minister's policy, so from Pandit Nehru to Narendra Modi, one thing is certain that we have remained consistent about our uh, foreign policy, the non-aligned foreign policy. The word non-aligned is not used these days, uh, but strategic autonomy is the word that has been used after the end of the Cold War. And now, even more interestingly, we are now aligning ourselves to what is called the Global South. So in other words, what we were doing for the freely independent countries, developing countries in 1947, we are doing basically the same thing in 2023. Because we have moved in various directions because foreign policy cannot be static. It has to be dynamic. So the first thing that we have to note and understand about India's foreign policy is that in spite of all the changes that took place and all the demands and the challenges we faced, we have remained unattached. Our foreign minister recently said non-alignment is non-negotiable. I'm sure Pandit Nehru would have said the same. So in other words, none of these changes in the government and the uh, policy challenges we had has fundamentally affected our position of being independent and taking decisions in its own merits rather than attached to one power or the other. Now, the, the best time India had, I would say, the period from 1947 to 1962, Though we were not economically powerful, we were not even uh, um, self-sufficient in food grains, and we had to depend on other countries, etc. But still, that was the period when our foreign policy enjoyed the maximum support around the world. Because we had become newly independent without a war. The non-violence of Mahatma Gandhi was well recognized. And we took on the leadership in the UN for decolonization. And that was the period, and also disarmament. And Pandit Nehru became a symbol of world peace, and everyone was very appreciative of India's position. But this did not last very long, because in 1962, the Chinese aggression changed the scene for us, because we were very idealistic during the first period. And therefore, we did not prepare ourselves to defend ourselves against even China, because China we considered it a possible friend, and we supported China in several 
uh, field, several areas, got China back into the UN, etc. And therefore, we uh, had a very rosy picture of an Asia, Asia African, India China, Bye Bye, an Asia African collaboration, and thus develop an Asia African uh, group, as it were, and also uh, resist certain things like uh, apartheid, uh, like uh, protecting Palestinian rights, etc. Et but once our weakness as a military power was shown, it became very difficult for us to uh, protect our standing. And therefore, we needed to go and protect ourselves. We had to invest. We had not invested much in defense. We had to start that. We had to look for friends who will give us infrastructure, other capabilities, steel, ship, manufacturing, everything. And we had no foreign exchange to find. And therefore, a splendid opportunity came when Soviet Union was willing to buy our consumer goods and exchange for our for it for them, you know, basic industries, steel, shipping, planes, very many things, even one of the IITs. So technology that was available in the Soviet Union, which suited us because we didn't have any sophisticated technology, and our consumer goods satisfied the requirements of the Soviet Union, while the West was too sophisticated to buy our consumer goods. So what was a pragmatic decision? That is to work closely with the Soviet Union and also follow the, the five-year plan that was a copy of the 10-year plan. When your resources are less, naturally you have to plan it accordingly. So an impression was created in the process that we were becoming closer to the Soviet Union and we are moving away from non plan but what we need to remember is that at that time, even at that time, we had not endorsed the Soviet view of the world. We had our own view and we had our own position, depending on the merit of every, every occasion. And then, of course, the Soviet uh, Union collapsed and um, a new world global situation arose. It became a uni all our world with the Soviet United States in the center. And everybody, including the new Republic of Russia, were very keen to build good relations with uh, the United States. So we too decided to liberalize our economy. These are compulsions to globalize our economy and open our markets after 50 years uh, to Western goods and services and uh, in that period, which is considered a, a globalized foreign policy, so first the idealistic, the second was pragmatic, and the third was a globalized uh, foreign policy. And that started with uh, Prime Minister Narasim Rao in the 1990s, and uh, then went on to 2014. Of course, again, many things happened uh, during this period. Uh, the the Chinese became a, China became a nuclear weapon state. Uh, we did not, uh, in 19, 1964, China became a nuclear weapon state. We had the technology at that time. We wanted to uh, answer that, but uh, we decided not to. And we waited till 1974 to demonstrate our technical capability, nuclear capability, though we did not declare ourselves a nuclear weapon state. So that was a major. Uh, development of uh, the so-called uh, pragmatic period. And so uh, we uh, wanted, you know, in all our non-aligned movement statements, there was this consistency, opposition to certain uh, evils of the society, but at the same time, remaining faithful to our, uh, our uh, declaration of non-alignment. So from non-alignment to strategic autonomy to uh, the present moves to unite the global south. I think the policy is all the same. It is with a due respect to all the countries, non-intervention internal affairs, but certainly protecting our uh, interests. So it was a dynamic foreign policy and it has continued to be so and that I suppose this will continue because we have shown that we are not going to be uh, attached to any particular block. 
two occasions when our non-alignment was challenged and people even said that we were moving away from it. First in 1971, uh, that period when we signed a treaty of peace, friendship and cooperation in the Soviet Union. Uh, because that treaty said that a threat to one of the two countries will be considered as the threat to the other, had a flavor of uh, a kind of uh, a block. Because when you have a treaty like that, which becomes a defense treaty, then it appeared to be uh, or moving away from them. But Mrs. Gandhi was very clear at that time, said this was a matter of importance for us, the Chinese threat was already there, and then we had this Pakistan uh, threat and uh, Bangladesh trying to liberate itself, and uh, they had no friends to support them. So in that process, it was necessary to get the help of a powerful state, not that the Soviet Union fought the war for us, but they gave us the cover by sending the, their submarines to uh, the Arabian Sea and uh, ba ba Bay of Bengal. So on the one hand, we had uh, the American uh, flotilla threatening to come to the Bay of Bengal to stop us from interfering, intervening in uh, Bangladesh. But our defense was number one, that they had already captured some places of Indian territory on the Western Front. Uh, secondly, about 10 million refugees came into India from Bangladesh and they had to be sent back. And then naturally also our support for the principle of liberalization, liberation of, uh, of the country. So that was a time when there was a lot of uh, criticism, even within India, that we have abandoned uh, But again, it was true that we sought their moral and political support. Uh, and it took a long time for the rest of to uh, fall in line. But Bangladesh was recognized by several countries uh, by the time that uh, after a few years, we returned all the soldiers to Pakistan, and the Simla agreement began a new process of uh, good relationship. It did not, uh, did not uh, uh, succeed, and the Pakistan situation uh, remains, unfortunately, in the same place. And 1990 to 2014 also, we had several changes. We established diplomatic relations with Israel, our cooperation with the Soviet, with the United States uh, increased. And the next time that there was a question was when we signed the nuclear deal with the United States. Again, some people criticized, saying that this is giving up a non-alignment, but it was a very vital interest for us in order to get rid of this problem of the uh, nuclear non-proliferation treaty, which we had refused to sign because it is discriminatory. So we had to find a way. So the United States agreed to treat India as a technically developed responsible country, even though we had not signed the NPT, and that suited us on that occasion. And uh, the left parties left the Manmohan Singh government uh, in protest. But that decision turned out to be right. We stopped becoming uh, an outcast in the uh, nuclear world. We could uh, import nuclear material for our uh, electricity production. So this was also, which was considered a deviation, uh, turned out to be good from our perspective. Of course, uh, we could not get into these uh, nuclear suppliers group and such groups which we thought we would be able to get, although we didn't get that, and it did not fulfill the promise of uh, nuclear trade with the United States, it did not get fulfilled. Uh, but this was a new uh, era in our relations with the United States, which was the, the only country, only super power. And so we had a very cooperative relationship. And even Russia was at that time trying to be as friendly as possible to the United States. And we carried the non-aligned group with us in this, and there was much appreciation and whatever uh, problems there were, uh, we were together with uh, the non-aligned countries. And if you look at the latest, uh, you know, the declaration of the non-aligned movement, the meeting was held in Venezuela, you will find the reflections of the same thought that Pandit Nehru had created. So it has become universally acceptable that uh, while remaining 
I'm not attached to any of the particular blocks. We could cooperate among ourselves. There have been several groups have been formed, BRICS and various other things. Other things. Even Russia, you know, even Russia, India, and China happened to come into the same group. And so it was a matter of uh, somewhat loosely called multi-alignment. I wouldn't say multi-alignment, but multi-cooperation. Multi and uh, basically, whoever respected our view and whoever was willing to join with us, we made these groups, which uh, helped us to develop our own relations, not only with these countries, but also our internal development. And then came a big change in 2014, uh, when uh, Mr. Narendra Modi took over as Prime Minister. He spelled out clearly India's priorities are. He said that the security, it is development, it is neighborhood, as well as the diaspora. So very clear, again, non-aligned position. Uh, but our priority, of course, was to get security from wherever we can, and also development assistance and development cooperation wherever we can. So by then, of course, our technology had developed uh, much, and the Indian diaspora began to influence the world. So our standing in the world had considerably risen by the time Mr. Modi became Prime Minister. And uh, he uh, refused to remain on the, on the edges of the world. And he said that he was not going to stand on the side of the ocean and walk, watch the world as it develops. But he said, I don't want to get into that. I like to walk into it and be part of it and try to influence the world developments. And that is why it is called an assertive foreign policy. Uh, but whatever he did during his first term, traveled to 50, 52 countries. And if you look at them, you'll find that it was all within the policy of uh, strategic autonomy, as well as friendship with other countries, regardless of their political color or uh, the kind of governments they have. So we looked at them from our perspective to develop our industries, to develop our trade. And uh, since we had liberated trade and we had reached 11% uh, growth at that period, and it was a very good time to deal with uh, the issues. And uh, Mr. Modi's foreign policy is considered more assertive, but he again followed the same kind of approach. Uh, during uh, Mr. Manmohan Singh's time, we had to got close to the United States in many ways, uh, but uh, because of the signing of the nuclear deal, uh, but uh, Mr. Modi, who was refused visa by the United States for many years, he had no hesitation in building a new development uh, with the United States, and he had a very good equation with uh, President Obama. He visited India twice, and it led to a new understanding on the what is now called Indo-Pacific. It was Asia-Pacific at that time. Uh, but the world shifted from the Atlantic to the Pacific in the 21st century. And therefore, it was necessary for us to work closely with the democratic countries of the region. And that is why the Quad was formed. Of course, the Quad was not a military bloc, though the other three countries would have liked it to be a military bloc. Because they're all, in any case, aligned with each other, Australia, United States and Japan. But we, even at that time, remained rather adamant that we are not going to turn it into a military bloc. And that is why some Western countries got together as an AUKUS, Australia, US, uh, uh, and so, uh, UK, and so on. So they found that Quad will not become a military bloc, and therefore they uh, created another uh, group in order to take care of the military aspects. And we uh, maintained that. Uh, and in 2020, when China uh, you know, moved into Indian territory across the line of control, it was a real threat. Uh, we did not know why they did that. As we, have, we have not known why the Chinese have done various things in the past, except to teach, teach us a lesson, as they always say. Uh, but 2020 was a big challenge because they occupied several positions. And for the first time, after 62, one or two incidents after that, lives were lost, even though there was no uh, shooting 
but uh, very cruelly our soldiers were killed by the Chinese and we retaliated and that was a landmark. And at that time, our relationship with the United States paid us paid off well. And uh, uh, President uh, uh, Trump supported us fully, even though not, no intervention, but also strengthening our contracts, getting necessary equipment. The France, the France self sold us the or expedited the sale of uh, fighter aircraft, uh, which we had bought from them. And uh, the Russians also uh, agreed to speed up the delivery of the, of the missiles that we had ordered with them. So that all we did, but we did not join any of the groups that did not declare war or anything of that kind. We were negotiating since then. And in fact, we were negotiating even yesterday uh, on the Republic Day. But uh, the point is that the Chinese have not fully withdrawn from all the posts they have occupied. Uh, but more seriously, they have abandoned or disowned many of the treaties that we have signed with the Chinese, like the 1988 one, 1993, the War of Peace and Tranquility on the Chinese border. Uh, all these were abandoned, and therefore, our relationship with China at a, is at a crucial time because we do not know what their intentions are. Uh, they are expansionist, and they have uh, threatened the whole of uh, East, um, the sea, in, in the ocean, all these uh, areas, and they are threatening to um, uh, attack Taiwan if necessary to take it back to, the, to China. So it's a, they're in a th threatening mode, and therefore, we are not very sure as to whether we are safe, and therefore we have built our uh, defense capabilities, and uh, we have uh, built up friendships uh, with various countries. We have tried to decouple Chinese goods, Chinese trade, and also try to reduce our dependence on China for various things like uh, pharmaceuticals, etc. So all these had its impact, and China blows hot and hot and cold. Uh, but really, there is no progress in getting them out of the line of control, the other side of the line of control. And that remains an issue. And therefore, all these uh, issues uh, keep coming up with China, but we have managed fairly well. Then, of course, we cannot forget the, the four major calamities that uh, hit the world during uh, that period of that uh, because we had... Uh, 9-11 attack, which uh, changed the whole scenery about uh, nuclear capability and, and uh, relative strength of major powers. Because even if you have all the capacity to destroy the world, you know, 10 unarmed people could uh, humiliate you and uh, cause major disaster. And uh, that, of course, got a little bit of improvement in, our, in, the, in the security relationship. And also terrorism was uh, uh, outlawed in many ways, though we do not have a convention yet. But some progress was made. That was a good aspect of 9-11. But terrorism still continues. Afghanistan was lost in the process. All this uh, had happened. Then there was the economic crisis, which we, had, um, Dr. Manmohan Singh, played a big role in resolving it. And uh, we also remained a little bit aloof from uh, the problems at the period, though they persist. Then, of course, the pandemic was the biggest disaster that ever struck the world. And the world was not united because of China. United Nations could do nothing, not even call a meeting of the Security Council, unlike when other big disasters occurred, and uh, completely neutralized the United Nations. So each country had to go on its own. But India was the first to call a meeting of SARC, the Nasdaq meeting of G20 to bring about some about the cooperation because the things were getting bad to us. And we did what we can in terms of supplies and terms of uh, looking after ourselves and so on. So by and large, the world has recovered from it, but there is no guarantee that this is final. And so it has left its wounds. And to add to all this totally unexpected uh, move by Russia into Ukraine, Everybody thought it would be a short war of a few days. Russia will overrun Ukraine, but uh, 
that has been proved false. Now we are nearing the second anniversary of the war, which has affected the entire global situation. Everything, food, um, gas, um, communications, everything. It's not the same world at all. And every day that the war, war continues, we are moving towards a disaster of some kind. Poverty and uh, lack of uh, uh, food, energy, and various other things. So the whole world is now focused on somehow resolving it. And as it has happened, we have become the president of G20 at this time. And uh, now, even though we have done a lot in terms of promoting SDGs and various other things under the G20 rubric, now the test, real test of G20 is whether it will be able to resolve or at least have a unanimous uh, resolution adopted in India. Uh, but the signs are rather uh, pessimistic because uh, both Russia and NATO uh, believe that they can win the war, which is a foolish concept. Nobody can win a war in the present situation. But nobody is go going towards the uh, negotiating table as we have advised them. Prime Minister told President Putin in the face of the whole world that this is not the time for war and we should move towards negotiations. Uh, but both sides are guilty in this by uh, carrying on the war. And uh, we hope that we'll be able to uh, help in this process. And then finally, what happened was, even though the Americans and others kept asking us to join the bloc or at least turn the Quad into a nuclear uh, to a, um, allies, uh, alliance, we have resisted it completely. But the good thing is that in spite of that, like the United States agreed to, uh, you know, change our nuclear position by signing the nuclear deal, the United States again, again came forward uh, to sign a number of agreements which would give us the kind of equipment and machinery that they would normally not give it to non-allies. So they have a non-NATO alliance system. We are not even part of that. But uh, without any change in our policy, of, uh, uh, of strategic autonomy, we have been able to sign a number of agreements which will transform the relationship with the United States and democracies in general. So people believe that this is the beginning of a new world order in which democracies and autocracies might be in uh, confrontation with each other, or at least they may get together eventually. That kind of expectation is there. And we have taken the lead uh, by agreeing to accept some of the uh, conditions of uh, of allied countries. But there again, our position is very clear. We are not allowing the United States to dictate to us on human rights and democracy, etc. We have stood very firm. But it is, of course, the China factor which has prompted the uh, United States to come closer to us under any circumstances. And that may be the reason why the Chinese have suddenly become quite reasonable in the next negotiations. So, in other words, as the Prime Minister spoke at the ramparts of the Red Fort yesterday, we have a very optimistic picture. Of course, he started off with Manipur, which is a big issue even today. And he was a, he talked about it first as an internal problem which we have to deal with, the one the basis of the principles that we have valued and the constitution. And on the global front. He also said that in the next ten, five years, India would become the third biggest economy. Of course, Germany and Japan are on the fringes. So Germany and Japan are not doing so well, and therefore we are, and we are doing well. So it's quite possible that we may overtake Germany and Japan and become the third uh, GDP growth, the third uh, powerful country in the world that he has promised. And he's also promised to come back next year to the uh, to the Red Fort, which shows his optimism about his own election prospects. So that optimism, I think, we can share on uh, this occasion, even when we are talking about foreign policy. Uh, we have managed to deal with all these crises in a reasonably efficient manner. And I suppose the credit should go to the Prime Minister himself, his foreign minister, and their entire external affairs ministry because Indian diplomacy has come of age and we can now stand up to anyone in the world. 
for what we consider right. At the same time, we will, of course, be friendly and, uh, and close to the other countries. So this is the shortest way I can present to you the picture of foreign policy in the last uh, 76 years. And it's full, it's full of optimism and full of hope that we move on to next year. And uh, if the war ends, nothing like it. Otherwise, we have to uh, learn to be resilient. People are finding solutions, even if the war, war continues. But either way, I think we are a very optimistic. Thank you. Well, that is an obvious uh, question. The answer is also very obvious. If the Cold War had continued, we would have remained in the same position as before. But once the Cold War ended, naturally we were able to readjust our position. And we have done very well. So certainly it is, monthly alignment was possible because the Cold War had ended. The rigid situation of military blocks relaxed. And so uh, we were able to deal with countries in the middle, like France, like Germany, like uh, Japan, and all the or not very hardcore uh, NATO countries. And our expectation was that, uh, in fact, uh, we may be able to have a have a poll of our our, our own with some of these uh, countries as our partners. But the big change that took place was Russia signing an agreement with. Uh, China, which has changed that situation. So now Russia will not be around with us to support us as they used to do in the past. That's a big change. And therefore, we have to find our way. And the Prime Minister's visit to France soon after his visit to the United States indicated that we are not putting all the eggs in the U.S. basket. We also have other options. France has been much more generous and much more genuine with their support for India. And therefore, we have all these options. Certainly, yes, the answer is yes, that it is the end of the Cold War, which enabled us to have this so-called multi-alignment. I don't like that phrase, really, we are not. Multi-alignment means you are aligned to all of them. It's not so. We are friendly to them, and the position is more or less the same. Yes, we are the leaders, particularly since G20 has happened at this time, and we are uh, president of it. We have used every opportunity uh, to promote global peace and uh, interests of the developing countries in our bid for a global south. And that will be the constitution. Now. And that will be the situation that uh, we'll be facing in the next few years, that uh, we'll be one of the leaders of the global south. And there is recognition that this is... Uh, becoming a strong influence in the world. And uh, people will listen increasingly because cooperation is required in major issues like the pandemic, um, the climate change, uh, the war. These are all issues on which we need to have very quick movement to save the world. And uh, the Global South's voice is being heard. And I don't know whether they're abiding by it, but they, they do respect. And that is what we will try in G20 summit, how to push them to peace by voicing the voice of the South. Well, I'm not a constitutional expert, um, but we know about the Article 370, we know about uh, Citizenship uh, Act, and those all, those all seem to have settled down. And now, of course, the question is of Manipur, people are accusing the central government and the state government for you know, uh, creating more trouble than solving them. And it has become an unacceptable situation. So the government had to move in very strictly and very strongly. And things seem to be improving, but it is not the end. Prime Minister himself did not claim that the problem has ended. He said, we need to work much harder in order to move this. In fact, it has to be within the constitution, by the way, we do. And uh, therefore, that is what we will do in any case. I think our Home Minister said at some stage uh, that uh, many uh, people from Myanmar had uh, intruded into Manipur and have caused havoc there. 
on one side or the other. This is not fully established, but uh, as you know, Myanmar is in a very tough situation. They are continuing their, uh, you know, despotic treatment of their people, and uh, any amount of sanctions and other actions by the Western powers do not seem to have made any impact on them. And they uh, declared that Aung San Suu Kyi is uh, free, but she is immediately arrested on other counts. And therefore, she is likely to spend all her life in jail. And there is no other move towards any kind of a solution, even the Americans and others. Even ASEAN is divided on this issue. The ASEAN position, some of the countries in ASEAN itself are questioning them. And uh, therefore, we are in a dilemma because we have been following the ASEAN position and because it is their regional organization. And we have recognized the military regime. Normally, we would have uh, remained uh, close to Aung San Suu Kyi, but because of our primary interest in, uh, in Myanmar uh, to be a friendly country on our border, we have made adjustments in our attitude to the military government. But there has not been any reciprocity from the military government. They have not done anything to make us feel happy. And uh, so the situation continues as a, a, a big issue. And it is quite possible that the, since the borders are more or less open and these people are similar looking uh, people, so infiltration is possible. And um, there are many Myanmaris who may want to escape from Myanmar. And they may use this opportunity to do that because it may be difficult for us to identify them and send them back. So that situation may also arise. There are many, many people in um, Myanmar who are stateless. And um, they may use this opportunity to run away to wherever they can. You know, whether by boats or over the, across the border in India. Well, you all know it. You know, I don't have to explain it to you. We had very grievous losses initially, particularly the second wave. Unimaginable things have happened. We've lost lots of lives. People are dying on the street. There was even, not even facility to cremate them. It is horrible, very, very bad it was. But uh, we developed our own vaccines and even shared it with the rest of the world. And a lot of goodwill we got on account of that. And we also managed to control the pandemic to a great extent. So there is no guarantee that's over. Uh, but uh, we have strengthened our health facilities to the extent that we can. We were overwhelmed by it, like any other country. Even the most developed countries were all by it, including the United States. It was, it was, in fact, it was the developed countries which suffered the most in terms of casualties and so on. Even China has repeatedly been affected by it. So compared to all that, we have not done too badly. And uh, we have the uh, capacity to to vaccinate people. And there was no resistance to vaccines in India, except very few people. And so it was a successful uh, effort. And uh, of course, it has affected India like all other countries, our economy. Uh, the inflation has gone up, our rice, you know, price rise is a, a big issue we have to face. All that is there, as uh, Prime Minister acknowledged yesterday. But uh, but certainly we have done better than many others, and we hope to continue to do so in the future if there is any other indication of a, of another uh, attack of uh, the pandemic. I don't think it has, as far as I know. What I heard was Pakistan Army as well, reasserted in the sense that Imran Khan has been removed. That, of course, was easy. But that is not the issue. The, is the, the army itself does not, because Pakistan is on the brink of a failed state. And uh, they are only borrowing money to pay for the earlier borrowings. There is no other economic activity there. Trying to get as much money as possible from wherever they can get. The Chinese have been keep, keeping them aloft. And IMF also. But IMF's rules are very strict. So 
they virtually have no money for development. And this is starving the army also. So the latest reports I saw was the army, since they don't have resources from the state, they are moving to economic activities, farming and industries and all that. So they're becoming a capitalist unit because they want to survive. So with the money they have for fighting wars, they are spending it on development activities, which is good for Pakistan. But that has made them very weak. And I do not think uh, uh, that Pakistani army is in any way ready to fight any war in the future. And that is what good news for us. Of course, the Americans have remained at a distance, but at the same time, they have recently given money to maintain the aircraft and such things, which uh, President Biden has a certain soft corner for Pakistan. That has happened. But not the kind of full support that they used to get. So in a failing state like that, unless you have a very strong supporter, you cannot survive for too long. And uh, therefore, it is on a brink of disaster, according to everyone. Now the elections will come. Nawaz Sharif may come back. The army may again control the country because we all know that the Pakistan army runs that state. And therefore, uh, reassertion is only politically. But the, uh, and, uh, the Shabazz Sharif had spoken about some talks, talks with India. He didn't mention the country. He said, our neighbors are ready to talk. But who wants to talk to them unless they give up uh, terrorism. And so we are not excited by it. But at that time, army also, maybe for the first time, said that we should talk to our neighbors. We are the ones who have prevented civilian governments uh, to negotiate. And here, of course, the um, situation is uh, pretty bad uh, within Pakistan. We are resolving it. Nepal is a big, not a big issue anymore. Nepal is cooperating with us to resolve it. And as far as the LAC is concerned, the new, latest news we heard was that yesterday there was some new understanding. We don't know how long it will be maintained. But there was also, you may have heard, there was a report that uh, Xi Jinping and Prime Minister Modi uh, talked to each other in uh, Indonesia. And the Chinese uh, reported that there was some progress, which we denied first, but we now also accept that, yes, there were more things discussed at that time. So if that is true, and if there is some understanding on a new footing, then good for both of us. And um, so it will uh, be helpful for us to uh, have a, you know, uh, a friendly situation in our, our neighborhood. But the neighborhood has always been uh, difficult for us. And even though we kept saying neighbors first, our neighbors became worst in the early years of uh, Mr. Modi's uh, government. Uh, but hope this, fully, this might help us to move forward. Yes, our policy has been good. Sri Lanka has come around. Bangladesh, have a, we have a good relations. And Nepal is good. So it, except for Pakistan, I do not think that we have any enemies in our neighborhood. But they all have complaints and needs and requests uh, to be met. Uh, but um, our policy of uh, being firm, but fair and reasonable, is paying back. And uh, uh, the SARC has collapsed. Uh, but our position of no conversations with them has remained strong and firm. And so I come back to my old point that uh, we have remained very firm, flexible at the same time, in order to meet the challenges of the 21st century. Thank you very much. Bye.